Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel and Escape from the City on the ABC. And Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of the 2018 Property Investment Advisory Firm of the Year. Hi right, folks, you're on the Property Couch Rich Week. Ben and I bring in the Insider's Guide of Property Finance and Money Management. Hello, Ben. G'day, mate. How are we? Oh, mate, I'm very, very good, thanks. Good. Bit of a croaky throat for me, but we'll we'll battle on. All right. Yeah. What have you been doing? I don't know, just talking too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can vouch for that. I'm only serious. I'm only serious. Hey, um, quick bit of housekeeping. Today's Q&A day. And yes. Not only, is it, Q&A day. not only is it Q&A day, Ben, but it's speak pipe Q&A day, Ooh. which means the people get to hear themselves ask the questions. Perfect. Um, and it's uh, up to us to try and answer them. Beautiful. So uh, well, but I want to get to that. I want to do a little bit of an update on the marketplace as well. Yeah, let's do that. So uh, a couple of things. We have got uh, footy tips, uh, the Albatross. The Albatross. A6. Good and on you. Two points away from a uh, zero margin. So let us know. Albatross, send us an email where we need to send you a book. Beautiful. Um, but speaking of books, we've got uh, the competition closed for the FE book bed. Closed. 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 We had a fair bit Done. of feedback. People were giving Finished. us some wonderful money tips. But um, look, we have uh, we have some winners. We, we're going to announce two winners. Beautiful. Two winners. Great stuff. Yep. Uh, so the first one is from Katrina uh, Venables. Um, we have so many as single mum of three girls. So Ooh. here's her money hack, right? Yep. This is uh, just for, to refresh those folks. If you wanted a chance to win, you've got to let us know your best money hacks. And then uh, our panel, distinguished panel, which is pretty much Stig and Emma, um, have decided which ones are the winners. appropriate winners. All right. So this is from Katrina. Turn off all appliances at the switch after use and before bed. Two, buy everything you need secondhand in brackets except undies. Make friends with your neighbours and use their internet exchange for grown veggies. I like that one. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah. the neighbour wouldn't use yeah. all of their data download? Yeah, Wi-Fi for veggies. Yeah, yeah, got it. That's good. Let's hope the Wi-Fi doesn't kill the veggies over the fence. But <coughs> I doubt it. Uh, four, grow your own food. Um, and, my, and then Katrina also goes on to say, my life hack is give out kindness and it comes back tenfold. I make soup and dal for friends who have babies or are struggling, and my girls learn how to cook and how good it feels to give. O M G. Beautiful. If you're wondering why that was a winner, there it is right there. That is someone who gives Beautiful. back. Um, so, Katrina, congratulations. You are the winner. We are going to send you a book, uh, Effie's book, which is a ripper. Um, so, thank you for sharing all those wonderful money hacks, and good luck to you. And the other winner, Bros. The other winner is Carolina. Carolina. Um, with a K. K. If you want to spend money on a splurge item, make sure you set a rule that you have to match the spend with a save. Mm-hmm. So a $40 spend would require you to put an extra $40 in your savings kitty. Makes you think twice about how much you want it and you have to work twice as hard to get it or encourage you to find it at the best price. Often the splurge isn't worth it and if it is, it becomes a win-win. So that one's from Carolina. Love it. Which was about challenging material things. Do you really need some of them or not? Um, You do, Ben. But this one, I've got to say... Oh, no, no, that's our two winners, isn't it? It's two winners. But this one, I I just want to say almost won. Almost won. So what does an almost winner get, Bryce? Well, if we had three books to give away, this would have been the third. Right. But unfortunately, we don't. Are we, do we, are we going to give them a copy of, of, I mean, if it's good enough to be read out, surely they'll get a copy of our book. All right, you can be the judge, all right? Okay, all right. You'll be the judge. Here Ready? You go. This is from Carla, Chappie. Yep. Carla. Um, save dollars by not betting on Collingwood for a win. The returns are terrible. Ooh, okay, no book for Carla. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. We're the most successful team in VFL, oh, AFL gosh, history. Wake me up when you more finished. games than any other club. Oh. Good on your boys. Keep you working finished? hard. Didn't they, and didn't girls. They, didn't they reassess Thank that? You. Very so, good. So uh, there you go, folks. What a terrific, uh, what a terrific competition. Carlo, and you'll get a book. Don't worry. I got to, I, <laughs> there we go. And I've got to tell you, there are some amazing responses. So I think the Stig is going to give everyone a copy of the... Uh, the PDF version the of hacks. the Make Money Simple oh. Again, Ben. So anyone who's contributed. Oh, everyone. Everyone gets. We're going to give you the PDF, PDF version of that. 
customised version too. They get to choose their own adventure. They do. Which, they do. Whichever is their case. Yeah, true. Ooh. Their case study, which is the most cool. correct. And then I'm actually going to use some of these responses as future life slash money hacks, Ben, because yeah. they are absolute rippers. So, Beautiful. Thank you, community. Which is pretty good. And uh, Ben, of course, you and I have been in the thick of live teaching yes. uh, yesterday and today, which yes. has been heaps of fun. And of course, uh, tomorrow. So if anyone's interested, Stig, you'll have some notes in uh, the show notes so you can come and join us for the last day. Mm. Ben, have some live teaching. Now, you've got some stuff you want to cover off today as well. Well, I just think it's important that, um, you know, we've been talking about the economy, we've gone past the election, so, you know, no more political chat. Um, so what's happening out there? So I just think it's really important we have a look. So the CoreLogic auction clearance rate numbers were quite smart mm. in terms of, so Sydney's preliminary results over the weekend was 74.7% from 522 auctions held on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Now, that's up from 313 from last weekend. Um, and the preliminary clearance rate for the prior weekend last week when was 56.2. Mm. Now you might be arguing, you know, on the back end of a, of a long weekend, so that's why it's different. But just to give you some context, Bryce, in terms of year ago clearance rate rise, 74 preliminary to a final clearance rate last weekend, the same weekend of last year, was 49.4. Yes, in the right, thick now, of the correction. Of course, we've got a lot more auctions going on. So there were 708 auctions this time last year compared to 522. So in summary, um, this looks like Sydney's best auction clearance rate weekend in two years. Ooh. All right, so just take note of that. Now remember, it's coming off a low base in terms of the volumes. Let's switch back to over to Melbourne. Melbourne looks like one of the best clearance rate weekends in 15 months. Okay, so we had 725 auctions. Uh, preliminary clearance rate of 67.9. Uh, volumes are still down compared to this time last year. Last year we had nine, 992 with a clearance rate of 56.2. Now remember that clearance rate preliminary is 67.9. So it's every chance that they're both going to be above 60% once we get all of the results coming through uh, for the last weekend. But that is again three weekends where mm -hmm. the auction clearance rate has been above 60. So. It's really important that we talk about this because this is showing us that buyers are coming back. Mm. We know in our business we've had an increase in inquiry, mm -hmm. so that's also, you know, but we're a sample of one. But I also want to make sure that people understand. Um, I saw it on the news on Sunday as well. Everyone was talking about Saturday night, uh, nightly news. They were talking about strong, looks like a stronger property market. That is true, but let's not get ahead of ourselves, right? Um, the media likes boom or bust. They don't like steady steady as she goes. So our view is we're going to flatten out, but what we don't want is FOMO coming back into the marketplace. It's not good for all of us. No. So we want a steady growth, a steady inquiry level. We don't want to go back to this boom bust period. Now we're going to get lower interest rates for us. So the reality it's going to is- provide a challenge for the uh, the powers that they go, well, okay, we want to balance up the economy over here, but- oh, Correct, correct. We don't want any more in, in you know, unproductive indebtedness. Mm. We don't want people paying overs, mm. but what we will probably see is in the better areas, a quicker correction, because they were the ones who obviously had the bigger volatility. That's what normally happens during that time. Now, you notice that I didn't talk about the other cities, Bryce. Why is that? Oh, well, mate, that, uh, the, the clearance rate in uh, Perth is uh, pretty, if you're not in the western suburbs there, it's non-existent. Yeah. And it just, uh, it's got in, no relevance, uh, in, has it? In Brisbane, is every now and then they'll uh, throw 40, something in. 40 properties or auctions or 25 or 20 out. It's just not statistically reliable mm. to talk about an overall market. So when you do read about the other markets and what they're doing, just disregard them. Mm. If you want to get better at doing your own research, then what you do want to do is exactly what Bryce just said there, which is to look at a localised area and see what's clearing in those particular areas. Because we've got to remember that it's the... It's the real estate agents who are ultimately going to be making a decision as to the best way to sell the property. Now, when we had the booming markets that we had back in 2015-16, everyone went to auction. There yes. were so many buyers on the ground, it was the best way to get an over-achieved result. 
Now we're noticing that the, the areas that are proven for long-term auctions are where most auctions are being held. So it's watching those areas and looking at those cluster markets, those localised areas and looking at their clearance rate is going to tell you an indicator of potential future capital growth in those areas. And our team analyses the, uh, the auction clearance rates first thing every Monday morning, um, if not sort of preliminary over the weekend. And uh, it's interesting where the, the number of private sales just jacked up. Mm. And so you're seeing those auction clearance rates which are really low in Melbourne and Sydney. Yep. But yep. imagine if all of those privates who actually did go to private that normally would have gone to auction, those clearance rates would have been abysmal. And and interesting too, um, and it's part of the discussion that we have all the time, is if you think about, uh, you talked about the localised content there as well, that's really important because if you're in Melbourne, yeah. you know, the stuff that we've been buying in the inner west and the inner north is um, still been quite strong, hasn't come back. but. If you're in the leafy, sort of bayside, leafy east, mm -hmm. some of that stuff has uh, corrected quite significantly. So yep. those people were feeling the, the pinch. And so our clients are like, oh, hang on a second, well, so be careful, because where we are, it's still strong, still yep. clearance rate. So it'd be nice to actually get those uh, reported, and we do analyze it into uh, subsections, yep. but it'd be nice to report it on a, on a bigger picture level so people could actually see where the swings in uh, the sentiment in the clearance rate is actually happening, because it's, no one's buying Melbourne, Ben. They're buying a localised house in a localised Correct. street. Correct. They're buying one at a time, Bryce. And that's why auction clearance rates are part of that story. But we've always say to you, if you're going to do this yourself, um, you need tools like location score and those types of things to do that because it's not just about auction clearance rate. It stays on market, stock on market, average vendor discount, it's vacancy rates, it's on all of those moving reason. parts. So make sure you do your homework before you execute because, yes, is now a good time to buy? you bet it is mm. a very good time to be buying real estate. But the, what's the footnote? Asset selection is more critical than ever. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, um, that was a good one, Ben, thank you. Uh, today is, as I said, Q&A day, it's the People's Day. I've got this uh, Mindset Minute theme that's been sent in to me from one of our listeners, Kane. Kane. And it's it's talking about a progressive, uh, you'll see, I'll, I'll, we'll sort of summarise it towards the end, but um, hey, this is from Kane. Hey guys, love your podcast, currently up to number 77, confirmed a lot of strategies and also learned a hell of a lot more, which is excellent, loving the guest speakers and the reinvesting information. Came Jeez, across this. You've gone 100 miles an hour I just thought then. you might <laughs> like it. Ben, well, I've got to get the, uh, yes, I've got to get this we'll get the Q&A. Unless you want to read it? No, 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 no. Take even longer. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, suppose that once a week, 10 men go out for a beer and the bill for all 10 comes to a hundred pounds, Ben. Yep. So just so we know, we're talking about Europe here. If they paid their mm. bill, the way we pay our taxes, it would go something like this. The first four men, in brackets, the poorest, would pay nothing. The fifth would pay one pound. The sixth would pay three pounds. The seventh would pay seven pounds. The eighth would pay 12 pounds. The ninth would pay 18 pounds. And the tenth man, in brackets, the richest, would pay £59. So that's what they decided to do. The ten men drank in the bar every week and seemed quite happy with the arrangement until one day the owner caused them a little problem. Since you're all such good customers, he said, I'm going to reduce the cost of your weekly beer by £20, Ben. What a good guy. Nice guy. Drinks for the ten men would now cost just £80. The group still wanted to pay the bill the way that we pay our taxes, so the first four men were unaffected. They would still drink for free. But what about the other six men, the paying customers? How could they divide the £20 windfall so that everyone would get his fair share? They realised that £20 divided by six is £3.33. But if they subtract, subtracted that from everybody's share, then not only would the first four men still be drinking for free, but the fifth and the sixth man would end up being paid to drink his beer. Mm. So, the bar owner suggested that it would be fairer to reduce each man's bill by a higher percentage. They decided to follow the principle of the tax system they had been using, and he proceeded to work out the amounts he suggested that each should now pay. Oh, you've got me in, in, interested, Bryce. Hang in there, folks. And so, the fifth man, like the first four, now paid nothing. That's 100% saving. The sixth man paid £2 instead of £3, a 33% saving. The seventh man now paid £5 instead of 7 which is 28% saving then. The eighth man now paid 9 instead of £12, that's a 25% saving. The ninth man now paid 14 instead of 18 which is a 22% saving. And the tenth man now paid 49 instead of 59 which is a 16% saving. 
Each of the last six was better off than before, with the first four continuing to drink for free. Sounds all right to me. But once outside the bar, the men began to compare their savings. I only got one pound out of the 20 pound saving, declared the sixth man. He pointed to the tenth man, but he got 10 pounds. Yep, that's right, exclaimed the fifth man. I only saved a pound too. It's unfair that he got 10 times more benefit than me. Mm. That's true, shouted the seventh man. Why should he get 10 pounds back when I only got two pounds? The wealthy get all the breaks. Mm. Wait a minute, yelled the first four men in unison. We didn't get anything at all. This new tax system exploits the poor. The nine men surrounded the tenth and beat him up. (laughs) Interesting parable. (laughs) Next week, the tenth man didn't show up for drinks. So the nine sat down and had their beers without him. But when it came time to pay the bill, they discovered something important. They didn't have enough money between all of them to pay for even half the bill. And that, boys and girls, journalists and government ministers, <laughs> is how our tax system works. The people who already pay the highest taxes will naturally get the most benefit from a tax reduction. Tax them too much, attack them for being wealthy, and they just might not show up anymore. In fact, they may start drinking overseas where the atmosphere is somewhat friendlier. (laughs) For those who understand, no explanation is needed. For those who do not understand, no explanation is possible. (laughs) So there you go, Kane. Um, uh, Try to explain that the tax system is... uh, It's complicated, right? Complicated. And there cannot always be winners every time around, but you want... uh, You want a society that pays their fair share, but you also want a society where there is recognition for the contribution that you also make. And getting that balance right, as we know, Bryce, is often difficult. But as you will well know that if it's not available here, then people might source it overseas. Exactly. So that's the that's the realities of a progressive taxation system. Yep. Well, where you know, if you're trying to make tax adjustments to it, um, that's where you're your challenge lies. It's, you know, it's the same with the consumption system. Everyone argues that a consumption system is not fair because the poor Percentage pay, of yeah, poor, you know, yeah. and, but the rich usually spend more mm-hmm. and hence they pay more. But it's, it's difficult, right? We all know it's difficult. So there you go. Thanks again, Kane, for seeing that through. Um, okay, let's go straight into our questions. The first one is from Craig and Stephanie. Uh, let's have a listen to this one. Good afternoon, Property Couch. My name is Craig and I have a question. Uh, My partner and I currently own three investment properties between us. Two of these properties are performing quite well in terms of growth and low upkeep. The third investment property in Darwin was originally brought as a place of residence and is not performing well as an investment. The market is at a 32% downturn and is unlikely to recover anytime soon. My question is, should we consider selling the Darwin investment at a loss, however still walk away with approximately $30,000? to reinvest uh, into a new or existing investment? Or should we hang on to this investment long term with the intent of recuperating our losses, even though this property costs us about $8,000 a year? Thank you for your time. Craig, what an interesting question. I I tell you what, Bryce, I do love these Q&As because we always get these little Mm. interesting ones. So there's a couple of moving parts for me here, Craig. Firstly, interesting, if if you went back up until around 2015, Bryce, and you looked at the last 10 years, so, so go back from 2005 to 2015, Darwin was one of the best performing markets over that 10 year decade, right? So you're sort of thinking, I'm in Darwin, I've done really well. If you got in there late, that's a challenge. Now, the interesting thing for, for Craig and for Stephanie is it's a principal place of residence, right? So they've potentially got a six year rule mm. that's sitting there as well, which, which means that it's not costing them much. They're out of pocket $8,000 per annum, so it's, I suspect it's negatively geared in terms of how they've done that. Um, we don't know what those costs are yet, so we don't know if it's a part of a managed uh, manage scheme, a, a, a owner's corporation or anything like that. So if it's a freestanding house, um, does it rent well? What's the sort of combinations there? So that's where I've got a little question mark in terms of I'd want more information. Mm. But generally speaking, if you've got a property in a marketplace that isn't attuned to see strong growth over the next three to five years, the opportunity cost is real. 
but the recycle cost in this particular case is only $30,000. So that $30,000 on its own, if there's nothing else attached to it, could probably still see us saying as part of a seller hold review that it's best to retain. Um, if they had other equity in one of the other properties that they owned, that combined with the other money that they've got to get into a better market if their borrowing power is higher, could mean that we would ultimately make a decision to sell. And this is the nuances around each individual circumstances. To just make a blanket statement about a property in a suburb around Australia to say buy or sell or hold is ludicrous. It comes down to the full number story, what you're gonna get out of it. Um, and if it was an investment property, um, then you know there's been no gain on the property. So that would mean, you know from that point of view, would there be a loss? Can you have that carried forward loss against another property? That is the science behind understanding the benefit here. And I know I'm sort of talking in circles here, Craig and Stephanie, but the reality is, is I'd need more information to make a definitive call on this particular property. Well, I think that's the, that's the ultimate challenge that we have when someone comes and talks to us. I've got, they, we've got four bullet points, mm. and so what should I do? <laughs> yeah. It's near on impossible, because it's, first of all, um, if two, two people side by side who are identical with the same bullet points, the same scenario, but one's risk averse and one's bring it on, uh, you have a different answer just on that thing alone, right? Yeah. So, and the fact that, um, you know, like you say, Ben, like it says that they'll walk away with 30,000, whether or not that loss means that they, um, uh, you know, can they offset it? If it is the principal place of residence going forward, mm -hmm. um, carry forward loss, because it's not an investment, right? Yep. So all those things come into the mix. Yep. But uh, from a helicopter view on this, um, what I normally say to clients is consider this. If you've got an opportunity cost, yep. um, how long are you till retirement and what, what do you need to happen in the next five to 10 years? Because that's really going to determine whether you actually want to get into the, buy the, you know, get the agent's fees and then, uh, like you say, recycle on getting back into the market versus, um, you know, is it in a part of Darwin that's likely to recover first or likely to recover last? Because remembering Darwin e even isn't in our top 15 populated <clears throat> cities around the country, <clears throat> even though it's one of our capitals. So the other consideration here is when markets like Darwin do have a turnaround, they run quickly, right? So if there's economic <laughs> stimulus um, around their mining or gas or anything like that, even beef industry is big up there. We know that there's a huge um, social services so there's, there's a heap amount of tenants who need to live up there that, that have effectively government uh, wages that are very safe at the moment. So that with lower interest rates could also mean that when it does move, it's gonna move reasonably quickly. So this is the other thing for me, if there's still five years to go on the six year rule, mm -hmm. then I'd probably be again sort of saying, well, let's see what the, the one or two extra interest rate cuts do to see whether it's, you know, you're gonna get a little bit of a spike and your 30 might be 70 or 80 really quickly. Okay, so so I'm, I'm a bit of sitting on the fence on this one unless there was more information. So Craig uh, and Stephanie, good question. Hey, um, I noticed that uh, you'd sent this in um, a little uh, little while ago, so perhaps you might want to give us an update on uh, what you decided to do and maybe we can uh, give some, or maybe give us some more feedback so that we can uh, embellish and give you a bit more detail on that. But uh, good question, um, and it might be something that's coming up for someone else. Here's the next one, Ben, from Aaron. Hi, Ben and Bryce. My name's Aaron. Absolutely love your podcast. Uh, I binge listened to 220-odd episodes in three months when I first found out about it. Uh, I've just got a question in regards to structuring your bank accounts. Uh, we rent fest. Um, understand if it was a principal place of residence, you'd want all income coming into that offset account. But because we rent fest, just wondering, do you have one bank account where all the rent and all the mortgages come out from, or do you have a separate bank account for each property where the rent and subsequent mortgage repayment comes out of? Um, didn't uh, manage to hear anything about structured bank accounts in any of the podcasts, so apologies if I've missed it and you have discussed it. Um, but I don't think I have heard anything about it, so um, very interested to hear your response on that, um, especially if you end up having sort of, you know, five, ten, even more properties. Thanks again, guys. You guys are absolute legends. Cheers. Oh, thank you, Aaron, for binge listening to 222 <laughs> episodes in three months. I, th I think that would have been some effort. They probably don't want to hear our voice uh, for a bit there. Hey, well, he's probably right too in the sense that um, we do a lot of our lending structure 
explanations in some of the webinars we mm. do and certainly in some of the visual teachings we do because a little hard need, to talk about yeah, like, you know, in terms of without demonstration. But I'm going to have a go, bros. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a go. So here we go, Aaron. Right, in theory, um, you'll always have a minimum of two accounts relating to your investment purchase. You will have, because we uncross securitize, so we don't cross securitize in terms of the lending structures that we do. So you'll have a loan of up to 80% against the investment property. Now, we all know that when we purchase a property, uh, we need to work out what the uh, remaining costs will be to finish off that purchase. So if we've got 80% against that property, the other 25%, uh, meaning the, the other 20% of the value of that property plus the 5% for costs have to come from somewhere else to complete. We call that funds to complete. So in a lot of cases, we want to use equity out of an existing property, um, which is hence introducing that second loan um, as opposed to paying cash. So some people might choose to pay a portion cash or they may choose to pay a portion in equity. Our best structures are that once the property investment's set up, you've got 105% lending against that property, um, which allows you to move forward with that purchase. Now, in terms of all of the payments and the money flow, this is where it's really important to follow our rules. And our rules are based on our Money Smarts money system, where we have, and even though you're rent vesting, which means you don't have an offset against your principal home, you must have an offset against one of your investment properties. And so we would always say, depending on which lender you've chosen uh, for price and also feature, um, that we want at least one of your lenders to have an offset. Now, if, you, if both of your lenders have offset opportunities, then we would put the offset against the lender that has the highest interest rate. It's a mathematical discussion, isn't it? It is. It's, a, it's all about the numbers, right? So, uh, so in theory, you put your offset, your primary account against the highest interest account, and you fill that bucket. Okay, you do not pay the loan down. You fill the offset bucket next to that loan. So, um, and all rent goes into that account. Um, it's really important that you understand that. So all monies flow into that account and then all repayments are made out of that account. We would also say to you as well, uh, because that offset is a standalone account and not a loan account, by doing so, you would also be putting all your income into that account. Now you might be saying, well, that's, you know, I'm not saving interest in doing so because, um, you know, ultimately it's not my principal place of residence. So you're reducing my interest costs, which means I may not get as much back. Now we don't know whether you're negative or positively geared. So we would always still say, organize your money that way. In terms of making your expenses, um, you'll have a choice there. If you've got some money in available redraw um, or some still some buffer lending, then we would say for expenses, use that money as opposed to using the money that you have in your offset account. Because ultimately, um, over the course of time, you're gonna do one of two things. You're gonna fill up all of your offset buckets, which means that technically you'll have no debt if you were to give that money back to the bank. Um, or if in 20 years time, 10 years time, you, you do choose to change your strategy, which we always say, if you're gonna be rent vesting, it's probably for the longer term. Um, but if you do choose to sell those properties, take that bucket of money and you put that, because it's obviously after tax, all of your income going in there, take that money to put against your principal home, which reduces your non-deductible debt, and it also ensures that your deductible debt against your investment properties are giving you the best advantages for you and your family. Yep. So that, that I mean, I could draw that, but that's how I say it in words. I think the buckets is the best um, visualization for a podcast, Ben. It's like just line up your buckets um, against the the debts, and and if you visualize that the the bucket that's the most expensive, Ben, just have that as the biggest one. Mm. That's that's the one you fill up, and, w and when it's filled, w where does it overflow onto the next one, which is the next biggest one? Yep. Um, but it's I, I haven't seen a better analogy than that. You're just filling up buckets. Uh, I've got um, a private loan that's got full um, uh, f offsets full at the moment, Ben. Yep. So I just found then I would just put an offset against the the most expensive investment debt that I have, so that yep. I can reduce some of the interest that I'm paying, um, which is important. Hey, um, 
Another extension of that, Aaron, and we have talked about this previously, but it's, it's worth mentioning, is that some people have big um, cash when they're buying their principal place of residence. And therefore, because of this huge cash component, they then go to the bank and say, well, I'll only borrow a smaller amount. Whereas our uh, recommendation is you go and borrow the maximum amount that you possibly can and then put your money into offset account. So say say the net was, uh, you know, you had uh, 300,000 in cash, Ben, and you were gonna buy a million dollar home, and so you're only gonna borrow the difference. Uh, no, that's not a good example. 300 cash and a 500,000. Yep. Um, so you'd only borrow the difference of 200. We'd actually say, no, go and borrow the full 400, um, and then actually put the whole 300, well, you, tip off 100 and you yep. just have 200 in offset. Yep. So that allows you to control your cash, it allows you to control your liquidity, make sure you don't sleep with one eye open at night. And if you're disciplined with that money, it's actually really, really good because if you at some point pay off the home and then realise that that house is actually a good investment property, we've talked about this previously, mm. um, you would just move that bucket of money and you'd go and lean it against the next optimal interest rate yep. um, loan that you have. Brilliant. So, so it's very good, Aaron. Very good question. Thanks again for binge listening 220 episodes in three months. Okay, the next one here. Let's have a little listen. Oh, hi, guys. Uh, my name's Shane. I'm just wondering about buying a unit in Sydney um, under a, a company title. Could you please explain any, any pros and cons to this type of unit? Um, I'm looking to rent it out for five years and move into it myself and keep it for the long term. Um, I appreciate any... Any uh, advice you can give me, and uh, thanks very much. Hey, that's a good question, Shane. Thank you for that. Uh, company title, uh, just for the record, you're actually not buying real property, Ben. You are buying shares in a company. It's not necessarily uh, the same as buying normal real estate through a standard title or maybe through a strata title. So I would say that it's important to realize that the lenders um, view company title differently. It's typically back in the 60s and 70s, they incorporated company, but then you have the constitution of the company may have somewhere that says uh, you need to determine from uh, two owners uh, who are the majority shareholders whether or not you can sell to X, Y or Z type of person. So I would suggest to you that um, uh, definitely look into it because it's not the same as buying a strata title and it's not the same as buying what's called a stratum title, and it's definitely not the same as buying a standard Torrens or green title. So uh, Shane, it's, it's good that you pick this up. The pros uh, are that typically you can find that they're cheaper, right? For that reason, because um, at face value, you could be looking at two side by side, and you go, hang on, that one's quite significantly cheaper than that one. Largely, it's around the fact that it's title, it's a non-preferred title, and therefore there's less demand for it. And again, you may not get pre-approval uh, for that type of lending as easily as you would for a strata title. So that's the pros for me. The cons are uh, the fact that you're not buying a real property and the fact that uh, you need to you need to get uh, legal advice around the constitution um, to see what sort of rules are in place that may have been in the favour of someone who's been living there, Ben, since the 60s or 70s and they've really stacked the... Uh, stack the uh, the regs uh, so that they have control and make sure that they can determine who comes in and out of the building, which therefore leaves them with um, a, a diminished market that you can resell to. So uh, it's certainly a good question and something that you'd need to look into further if you wanted to proceed. Yeah, so Shane, my, my view on this is I look at the marketplace in which this offering is. So if I'm looking at company title or stratum title in Victoria, there's not a lot of them and the banks don't necessarily have a big appetite for them in that sense. Now, if the banks don't have an appetite, we've talked about this before, we're looking at the secondary market in terms of who's gonna be able to buy it. But when I think about the Sydney market, there are a hell of a lot. I mean, it is quite common for the older style apartments, which we talk about having owner occupier appeal and character and charm, are very much company title properties in Sydney. It is very much an accepted type of title, and remembering it's not title, you're owning units in a company. You're buying shares. You're buying you, you shares. Own, you, department 200 might own share 200 to 299. Correct, correct. So, so now, if everyone agrees, um, over time you can potentially change it to a strata title. There is obviously a cost associated with that, but that's what we're seeing more and more happen in terms of uh, you know, owners corporations are getting together and they're looking at that. But so, so my view is I don't have a big issue 
with company title properties in Sydney, caveat here, you absolutely need to get that vetted by your solicitor or a, an expert conveyancer because they're, you know, they have their own constitutions and they could have put some crazy rules inside those constitutions which are going to limit the, uh, the type of people that can potentially come and be housed in your accommodation. They might have bans on certain things that you'd be thinking, well, that's gonna limit my rental appeal for future renters. So uh, on the whole, no, no real problem with them in Sydney market, but it, it's all down to the devil in the detail in regards to company title. So Shane, what I would say to you, um, you know, further to what Ben just said there, if you think about, um, if you're buying that property for you to live in as your owner occupied residence, um, and that's all you're gonna buy, that's, that's maybe one uh, scenario, versus if it's part of a portfolio or it's something that you wanna um, consider as part of a multi-property portfolio, because remember, Investing in finance is a game of finance just as much as it is a game of bricks and mortar. So that's what I normally suggest to my clients that sure you may be able to get lending for it, but do you want to add that layer of complexity into trying to build a portfolio out? So for me, I'm I'm pretty clear that, um, I've, actually I'll answer it this way, I've never helped a client, Ben, um, in my career mm -hmm. for investment by a company title and I've only ever helped one person um, buy a company title, Ben. It was on the show, it was in Sydney, um, and they wanted to buy it as a principal place of mm -hmm. residence. But um, I've helped people buy a company title, but uh, that's why I'm comfortable with because I lived in Sydney for 10 years and I, I know that market pretty well in terms of, I saw a lot of them, um, and the lending side is actually pretty easy up there. It's, very, it's a different story down here in Melbourne though. So there you go, folks. So hopefully, uh, there you go, Shane. Hopefully that helps you as well. Now the last one is from David List, who's a multiple contributor, Ben. Um, so Love David. Love the multiple contributors. Appreciate you coming on board and uh, asking us some more questions. Have a listen to this one, folks. Hey guys, Dave here. Today I wanted to talk to you about the elephant in the room, or at least the bear in the room. I just finished listening to the Barefoot Investor audio book, and it's safe to say I am a little bit confused. While Scott's money management message seems to align with yourselves, Mojo and Fire Extinguishers is a far cry from Money Smarts. And then came a bombshell. Property investing is a dud investment. And yes, as he suggested, my eye was twitching. Scott had some pretty negative things to say about property, particularly over the long term. Mainly that the past 24 years has been an economical outlier given the negative gearing benefits and large population growth due to baby boomers suggesting that doubling in every seven to 10, ten year rule, which of course is a rule of thumb, over the next 40 years would be near on impossible. Then he counteracted his whole argument with compelling evidence of strong long-term growth in bonds, shares, and index funds. Now, don't get me wrong, I took some really good nuggets out of his book, but the def differences from your methods and his are starkly different. I mean, he doesn't even suggest putting money in offsets. Can you please help me decipher this book? Thanks, guys. Love your work. Cheers. Hey, David. Thank you for that question. And uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge a couple of things. Um, Scott Pape has uh, two best-selling books in the top ten and have been for some time. And I think that he's changed the landscape for the positive with um, yeah, we most, love that. most of what he has to say. Now, clearly, uh, a couple of things, because we often get people um, when we've got our Make Money Simple Again book, they say, haven't you just sort of copied what Scott's already done? And so a couple of things on that. One, uh, we've been helping clients uh, use the money smarts well before his book was ever published. So that's number one. And number two, I think we're in alignment on a lot of things within his book as well. So I think the overall picture of uh, Scott Pate bringing that to market with his book is clearly a success. It's clearly people have got an appetite for it and clearly shows that uh, money management is something that people really want to get a handle on. And for the better part, the way that he structures using Mojo and fire extinguishers and all that, it's just a fun, cute way uh, for people to really break down the complexity of money and, and sort of chart the direction that they're going. But I think you've highlighted a couple of things that we differ on and we unashamedly differ on. And that's the fact that uh, we've got a, a starkly different view on, on property investment in the landscape. and. One of the, it's, it's the major question when, you know, whenever we're interviewed or asked about the difference between 
uh, his book and ours, we say, well, we think that the, the, the role that an offset account plays within your overall money management system is a critical role. Um, and for those that are familiar with the Money Smart system know that's our primary account. We see that as an optimal strategy to make sure you pay the minimum amount of interest, all those sorts of things. So I guess, Ben, as a backdrop, we, we are rowing in the same direction um, as Scott with his wonderfully successful book. But those two things um, around, we've clearly got a different view on investing in property and the fact that uh, we strongly, we think that, we think that Money Smarts isn't a system without an offset account. Um, they're the two critical pieces that we differ on. Yeah, yeah, no, here, here to Scott and, uh, and his team at the Barefoot Investor community because, um, you know, he's on the same crusade as us mm. and that's helping people organise their money. Any better. In terms of ultimately how they choose to invest that, he's got a view um, which is different to ours. So, um, oh, I, you know, I loved his book. I thought it was really good. It's a very good what to do book. Mm -hmm. um, and when I see research coming out from banks such as Ubank and all that in terms of you know, one in five have no clear picture of their financial situation. So only one in five have an idea, the other 80% have no idea about their finances. A book like that to at, just at least get you to Start sort of say, you know what, this money thing is not that complicated if you organise your money. Well, that's pretty much what we're, we're saying. I mean, we're talking about making it not a taboo, discussing correct. it at the table by the way that he's structured it means that people are having conversations about it. So he's done a terrific job. Yeah, in that our, our books are more of an instruction manual on a rules based money management system mm. um, that absolutely uses an offset account um, because ultimately we're writing it for people who are going to invest. And if they're going to invest in bricks and mortar, um, that offset functionality gives me far more far more flexibility and long-term returns than trying to get the cheapest no-frills loan that gives me none of that flexibility at all. So again, I think I think if I was to say Scott's books is the beginner's book um, in terms of trying to help um, anyone it's who's a learning, starter. it's really great. It's a great book. And then our book is a little bit more, you know, for the more sophisticated money manager who wants to make sure that they're trapping that surplus and the same sort of thing because ultimately we say that when you invest in property you're going to use leverage. So we are definitely for that more advanced investor than someone who's saying I'll just contribute an extra hundred dollars a month to my super you know, and hope that that gets me where I want to get to. So the people who are investing in property are saying the journey that I want from my returns are got to be significant compared to paying debt off or investing in basic superannuation policies. So that's that's our story. So there you go, folks. But um, we, we do get a number of questions around that. So all the in, time. In general principle, we're rowing in the same direction. Yeah. We just deviate a little bit towards the end as to which um, which destination we want to be in. So very good. So well, thank you to our contributors today. That was Craig and Stephanie. We had Aaron. Uh, we also had Shane and David. Thank you for those questions. Uh, we really appreciate those. And folks, um, I've got to tell you, absolutely love the speak pipe question. So if you go to thepropertycouch.com.au, there's a little widget on the right-hand side. Feel free to just push that. It's really simple. It's incredibly simple. You just go on any web browser. You can be on your phone. You can be on your desktop. You click on that link, and then it just says, there's a, there's a circle button. You press that and record and that is it and it comes through to us and we can put it up there so thanks for contributing um my uh life hack today ben is a money hack mm -hmm. it was from amy who amy gallifer who was on facebook who was part of the um, competition with effie i thought it was a good one she goes i use the three day rule ben if it's still if i still want something three days after seeing it then i buy it usually the impulse is worn off by then and I figure out I don't need what I initially thought I had to have. It works for everything from new clothing to a new car. It does. Three day rule. It's a, it's a ripper. In fact, if I was to think about um, my story around money management, um, subconsciously I've been doing that from day dot, um, looking at how, um, you know, the only thing I really splurge on for me, I've been thinking about this of late, is um, music equipment and audiovisual equipment. So I love music, I'm passionate about music, and I love movies and a good experience. That's probably where my budget, my, my discretionary spend is the most. But in terms of having a nice car or the latest gadget and all that, 
walk on. Mm -hmm. Nothing to see here. There is absolutely nothing to see here. So I've used that principle very effectively. I think it's a good one. So Ben, did you know? Did you know? So Bryce, I'm going to talk about stacking money. In a, you know, we're not all going to be trillionaires, right? I mean, obviously there are no individual trillionaires in the world as we currently speak. You know, 50 years time, the power of compound, who knows where some of these, uh, these guys are going to get. But I thought, I came across this one, and I thought, this is interesting. Okay, so if you stack a million dollars, okay, so $100 bills stacked on top of each other, right, how high do you reckon that would be? Oh, I have no idea. About one metre. Mm -hmm. So stack a $100 bill, and that's going to get you a million dollars. Okay, a billion dollars, so stacking $100 bills on top of each other, how high do you think I'll get to? Uh, well, it has to be a thousand meters, doesn't it? Very good. Mm -hmm. So there's a thousand. So it's a thousand point oh one. So a kilometer, mm -hmm. a kilometer in the sky. Now there is a building in um, in Dubai. What's that building? Is it the uh, Bur the, Bur the Burj uh, the Burj Bur or something? Yeah, yeah, the Khalifa. Khalifa. Yeah, that's the one. So that would be as high as that building, right? Okay. Now a trillion dollars, bros. Mm -hmm. Thousand of those. <laughs> Correct weight. <laughs> so it's 1,015 kilometers mm -hmm. high. So that's two and a half times as high as the International Space Station. Ah. Okay, so just to give you some idea, that's how high, if you stacked $100 bills on top of each other, exactly how high it would be. So there you go, did you know? I did not know that, Ben. So that means that uh, it's a, a little bit over a millimetre for a bill, is that right? I have no, well, yes, it Well, it sounds like you've been counting it. your money, so I just wanted I to know. know. <laughs> no, I've just got to come up with a little bit of an interesting fact each week, and this one caught my eye on yeah, Twitter. No, that's a good In one. terms of, like, there's, a, there's, a, there's an infograph. Oh, okay, I'll use that, put that in the little box. I like it. And I'll circle back to it. So I there like you go. It. There you go, folks. Hopefully you've enjoyed that. Thanks again to those people who contributed. We love Q&A Day, particularly when it's the SpeakPot Q&A Day, Ben. But until next week... Knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but only if you act on it. See you later, folks. See you next week. Hey there, folks. Bryce Holdaway here. Before you go, if you're new to our community and only listen to maybe a handful of episodes, I thoroughly recommend that you go all the way back to episode number one, where we unpack all of the foundations when it comes to property investing. Now, for those of you that might be a little bit time poor, I've got good news for you. We have a binge guide that you can download straight away, which summarizes the first 20 episodes where Ben and I unpack the foundational pillars of the A, B, C, D, and so much more. And you can get that straight away. If you go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20, you can download it and consume it whenever you want. It's completely free and available now. And for those of you, just a quick reminder that nothing we've spoken about today constitutes financial advice. We recommend that you reach out to your licensed professional advisor so that you can look at your unique circumstances before acting on any information. Now don't forget, go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20 and get your binge guide today.